Thank you, Brad. Uh, you know, I, I spent a little time with these three out front uh, waiting for food. If I'd known they were going to be at the head table, I'd been a little nicer to them. But, uh, I am honored to be here. Thank you guys for the leadership and bringing everybody here. Colonel, thank you for coming out and for what you do at Moody. And Myrna, thank you. Um, and and I, I, I can't say this too much to you. Myrna knows my phone number, y'all. And uh, she has been lobbying hard for today. And I really appreciate the honor and the invitation to be here. You know, Moody is a model, and Valdosta is a model for what military towns uh, kind of should look like, frankly. I grew up in Warner Robins, and Robins Air Force Base is another Air Force town here in the state, so I understand the ups and downs of, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't know what BRAC was. There was no BRAC back then. Uh, I remember the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we were talking about that a few minutes ago, that every B-52, KC-135, C-141 seemed like in the country were right there at, at Robins. And they were flying those racetrack circuits around Cuba and the North Pole. I mean, I thought the world's coming to an end. But I'm a, I'm a product of, the, of the, uh, the nuclear, you know, halo that we had in the Cold War. I mean, how many of you remember the, the nuclear bomb drills, right? Get under your desk. I mean, how smart were we? We all did that, right? <laughs> um, but I want to I talk to you a little bit today, briefly, about um, our world and where we are. I knew this. I, I don't like politics. I, as a matter of fact, I hate politics. And after the two years I ran trying to get in here, uh, I really hate it. Uh, but I, I will tell you, it, 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 democracy is working. I'm very optimistic right now. You're going to hear a lot of doom and gloom out of me in the next 10 minutes. But stay with me because there's, an out, there's, a, there's a way out here. Uh, I want to share with you a story about my mother, though, that I think speaks tons to this. Um, this process that we have, this democratic process. So my mom just recently passed away, and she'd be proud for me to tell you the story because she was very involved in this race. She was very involved in, in a couple races in the past, but I mean, she really got involved in this one. And, you know, about six weeks out, and this speaks to the national story of what we see going on in the country right now. Uh, the national polls had us down six or seven points about, you know, six weeks out from the November election. And, you know, the, the leaders in Washington, the Republican Party, were pulling out. They said, we'll be back in the runoff. And by the way, y'all, we had a nine-week runoff schedule. It would have been January 6th would have been the election day, the day that the other senators were going to It would have been a nightmare. And the bottom line is, is everybody in the country, except a few people on our team, thought we were going to get beat in uh, November. And the, the, the Democrats got confident. They poured a lot of money in here in the last six weeks, and the ads were really ugly. They bought Obama's uh, campaign person that ran against uh, Romney, and it got ugly. You know, and my mom called me one day and said, David, I love you like a son. I said, Mom, I am your son. You know? <laughs> but, but she said, uh, if, they, if the Democrats don't stop or if they, if they keep this up, I might not vote for it. I mean, this is, this is a nasty process we have, y'all. But the problem is that what we have going on in Washington right now is not working. And I want to try to describe to you that as best I can and then give you some hope about what you and I can do help change the direction of the country because we're in a spot right now where the world needs us to do that, not just our grandkids and, and, and so forth. we got to do that now. I believe right now the world has a global security crisis and it threatens us right here at home. I also believe that we have a, a global financial crisis and certainly a debt crisis here in the U.S. And somebody said the other day, well, when's that, when will we know the crisis is hit? I said, I don't know, but I believe we're looking at the beginning of this crisis in the rearview mirror. I really believe, y'all, we're in a moment of national emergency. I can't say that too strongly to you today. It, it, it drives me. This is what motivates me to, to, to do what we're doing right now, to try to, to, to you know, tell it and, and, and uh, make sure people hear the story and believe it. Because what happens in Washington, people get veils over their eyes, they start listening to national media, they start listening to their own staff, and all of a sudden, they get distracted away from the priorities that you and I know are the top priority in our country. This global security crisis is not new. Some of it is, is of our own making. Right now, we have on five different levels a world that's more dangerous than any time in my lifetime. I'm on the Foreign Relations Committee. As a, as a U.S. Senator on the Foreign Relations Committee, I can go in any country and have a meeting with any heads of state. And I've, I've been doing that from Egypt all the way up to Norway and all points in between the King of Saudi Arabia, the Prime Minister of uh, Iraq, Afghanistan. And these meetings, what I hear more than anything else, is that we need America to lead again. We don't need you to be our policeman, but we need you to lead. You're the leader of the free world. 
if you don't stand for democracy, what hope do we have? But on five different levels, you see Russia doing things now that we couldn't have dreamed of 15 years ago. They're threatening Eastern Europe in a way that we haven't seen in years. And right now in the Middle East, through all the shenanigans going on around Syria, they quietly control two bases that we don't even have in that region. They've got Latakia, which is a huge Air Force base, and Tortuz, which is a historical naval base, are now Russian. So not only did they capture Crimea a few years ago, they now have Tortuz and Latakia. So you think that doesn't strengthen their, their uh, arc of control over the Eastern Europe, uh, European countries? And then China. China now believes they can violate something that the, the countries of the world have had as a precept since you know, ancient times, and that is the seas are owned by everybody. They believe the South China Sea is theirs because a lot of natural resources are around the Spratlis Islands and so forth, and they have militarized those islands now by reclaiming out of the sea on these coral, <coughs> uh, coral heads, really, multiple islands. It's very dangerous. A lot of the shipping that comes in and out of the United States comes through the South China Sea. Then we see ISIS to some degree of our own making. When we moved out of Iraq prematurely against all military advice, we opened up a vacuum that allowed ISIS to grow there. As a caliphate, they had to have land. And so this allowed them to do that. And today, everybody's having a hard time rooting them out. And they have spread across the globe to where today, I believe, that our nation has been invaded. I believe the United States of America is at war today. We just don't admit it. When you see the rise of homegrown terrorism by a homegrown terrorist that has influenced and radicalized through social media and the internet across our borders, to me, I take that personally. America's in great danger right now because of that. In addition to that, though, we have something the world's never faced before, and that's the rise of nuclear proliferation among rogue nations like North Korea and Iran, where the threat of mutual annihilation may not be a deterrent, like it was in the Cold War. In addition to that, we're fighting wars now that we couldn't have dreamed of 20 years ago. We stood up, we're standing up two brigades, right, now, two army brigades of cyber warriors in Augusta, Georgia. Who could have dreamed that a few years ago? That takes a lot of money and time and energy. And the, the competitive difference between us and the rest of the world is closed dramatically in that technological area. And the one area that we're not talking about is the arms race in space going on right now, looking at what Russia and China are already doing. Militarily, and the, and the irony of this whole conversation about the global situation is the fact that in the very face of these growing threats, we have disinvested in the last seven years in our military in a way that we've not seen in the last hundred years. But this isn't the first time. We've disinvested the military in the 70s, we recapped it in the 80s, we disinvested in the 90s, we recapped it in the 2000s, and now we've disinvested again. To the point where we're spending on the military today 3.1% of our GDP. That's $200 billion less than just the 30 year average. At a very time when the threats that we face today were not even imagined when the budget for this year, 2000, or last year, 2016, was put in place by Secretary Gates. Now, Secretary Gates, the last time a military budget was put before Congress that was bottom up based on the threats to our country and the mission required to deal with those threats was 2011. Then a five-year budget, and one of those years was 2016. And there were tens of billions of dollars more asked for during that budget compared to what we have now. This is a top-down budget that we have based on sequestration that's taken tens of billions of dollars out of the military. As a matter of fact, discretionary spending, I'm going to talk about that in a second, but discretionary spending is down almost $400 billion since 2009 off a $1.4 billion at the top. So we're now spending just over a billion dollars, a trillion dollars uh, on discretionary spending. The government totally spent about $4 trillion. Well, that $400 billion reduction Half of that came out of the military, guys. And we're sitting at a time now where I've been around the world. I've been to Moron, Spain, and looked at the Marine contingent there as charged with protecting our embassies in Africa. And I'm here to tell you that they have just recently had to send back half of their squadron of V-22 Oscars. They're self-contained. Their mission is to go in those planes, get to Africa quickly, and defend our embassies and get the people in and out of there. Well, guess what? That mission is threatened because we don't have enough planes to train the pilots back here at home. We had to send half those planes back. j -Star, right here in Warner Robins, is under great threat to have an eight-year gap in the ability for J-Stars. And J-Stars is probably the most uh, impactful piece of technology that we have dollar for dollar in the U.S. military. 
I had a nephew in Iraq, Afghanistan, several tours there. And his uncle David said, I never went outside the wire. I didn't have somebody in my ear telling me what was going on over the horizon and just down the road. You can't do that with UAV technology. And the only place you can do it today is with the technology they have in those planes. We only have 16 of them. And they're 1950 vintage 707 Boeing airplane, y'all, that we bought from other countries after they were worn out. So our military today needs to be recapped. The Air Force today is trying, they have four priorities on the capitalization. And these are billions of dollars we're talking about here. The long-range bomber, the AC-46 long-range uh, uh, tanker, the F-35, and a replacement for JSTAR. This is tall, tall, it's a tall ass. It's a big project, and this is, this is overwhelming, the size of the recap is necessary. Do you realize today, we have the smallest army. This is not a stump speech. I'm, 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 these are facts. This is not a, I'm not giving you a partisan interpretation of any of this today. I'm trying not to. Because we've got Democrats and Republicans here. I want to speak to that in a minute about the way out of here. But today, the reality is we have the smallest army since World War II, the smallest Navy since World War I. We've cut the Navy in half in the last seven years, in half. We have the oldest and smallest Air Force ever, ever. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that right now we're on parity with China in the Pacific, according to Admiral Harry Harris, who's the, the, the PATCOM combatant commander, who I have a lot of respect for. And he is telling us what China is spending on their military is about $300 billion. We spend about $600 billion. They're spending in one theater. We're spending on all theaters. And here's the reality. $300 billion buys you a whole lot more in China than $600, $600 billion does in America. So they're, we're very close in parity. And that's why today, John McCain and I are joined at the hip. I'm on foreign relations. He's a chairman of armed services. And I have to tell you, it used to be in the United States Senate that we had defense hawks and we had budget hawks. And they were at each other. They were opposing each other and fighting and fighting and fighting. Well, today, I believe I'm the first one up there that has said we no longer have the luxury of having that debate. That you have to be both. Because if you don't solve the debt crisis, you're not going to be able to afford to defend the military or to fund the military to defend our country. One of only six reasons why 13 colonies got together in the first place was to provide for the national defense. And I'm here to tell you today that's under great threat. Can you imagine? In 2016, the richest country in the history of the world, I'm standing here telling you with a country that's spending 3%, $600 billion, and we're in great threat, but we are. And not only that, Europe right now is in great threat. Southeast Asia is in great threat. The entire world, from a nuclear proliferation standpoint, stands in great jeopardy. So at a very time when we need to be investing in our military, we've disinvested, but to recap that military, where's the money going to come from? That leads to the second crisis, the debt crisis. We have $20 trillion of debt almost. I have a debt clock in my office, the first one in any U.S. Senate office ever in the history of our country. A debt clock was in the office. Well, we've got it there. And you come to my office, that's the first thing you see when you walk in our lobby or our little reception area, is that clock. And it just spins and spins and spins and spins. You can't describe it. You have to see it. Go online. I think it's on our website still. Go online. You'll see that. The reality is this. The last 70 years has been the greatest economic boom in mankind's history. And we, you and I, have enjoyed that. But we're sitting at a time right now where I have to look at, and you do too, I have to look at my kids and grandkids and tell them I'm the first generation that has to tell them that I'm leaving them a country that's worse off than the one my parents left me. If that had to happen today, that's a fact. That doesn't have to be that way. And we can deal with that. We have over $100 trillion of future unfunded liabilities coming at us. And in the, the worst of it is if you put all that together, I can't relate to what a trillion dollars is. I was on uh, Scott's radio show today, and uh, we, we talked about that a little bit. You know, the way, best way I can conve con convey to you what a trillion dollars or what $100 trillion looks like is that every single family in this room, every single family in Valosta, every single family in America has a credit card bill waiting for them in the mail today. And it's one million dollars. Not only that, when your kids get out of college or high school, you as a parent are handing them a million dollar credit card. That's the reality of what we've done. So while we've had this great economic boom, here we are, and both sides are guilty. 
Under President Bush, we added $4 trillion to a $6 trillion debt in 2000. And under Obama, we've added $10 trillion. And in the next 10 years, unless something happens under President Obama's budget today, the way it's projected, we will spend another $10 trillion of debt. So we'll have close to $30 trillion of debt. Y'all, that, that's not possible. We can't do it. Here's why. Today at $20 trillion, if interest rates that are artificially at zero, basically, were at their 30-year average, we'd be paying a trillion dollars in interest. That's five times what we spend today. Remember when I said about the military, we're $200 billion short against what the 30-year average is? Well, imagine, we're spending $200 billion in interest today. That's less, in real dollars, that's, that's less than in the year 2000 when we have one-third of debt because of zero interest rates. If interest rates go back, that trillion dollars, I stop managing. Where's that money going to come from? And here's the problem. The problem is not a discretionary spending. That's about 1.1 trillion. The other, we spend almost, in round numbers, directly, this is, well, it's 3.8 trillion, what we spent last year. Next year, we'll spend about 4 trillion. So 1 trillion discretionary, 3 trillion dollars are mandatory. This is Social Security, Medicare, pension benefits for federal employees, and the interest on the debt. I'm here to tell you that that's the part that's growing. In the, back, in the next 10 years, we will borrow 35% of what we'll spend as a federal government. In the last eight years, we borrow 35% of what we spent as a federal budget, our government. And what that means is that every dollar we spend on discretionary, that means every dollar we spend on the military, every dollar we spend on uh, the VA, which is $200 billion, and every dime we spend on all domestic program spending, which is about $300 billion, is borrowed. Now, Colonel, I gotta tell you, if I'm Putin and I'm gonna stand up against you in Eastern Europe, that's a fact that is not lost on me. That every dime the US military is spending to, to defend not only Europe and the US is borrowed. It's so crazy, y'all. I mean, this is how crazy it is. We have these bilateral agreements. One of those is Taiwan. Our agreement with Taiwan says that if Taiwan is invaded by China, we have to go to Taiwan and defend Taiwan against China. But to do that, we have to go to China and borrow the money to go to Taiwan and defend Taiwan against China. Now you tell me that's crazy. That's insane. But that's a reality. And imagine if you're a 20-year-old or 18-year-old, 19-year-old, and you're thinking about dedicating your career to the military, or you're a 17 year we placed, I think we placed Colonel 23 academy <coughs> placements this year. That's a record. I mean, that's remarkable. That's just one of us. And these young men and women are so accomplished. And they're looking at us and saying, I'm willing to give you my career. What are you going to do for me? Well, I have to tell them, hey, every time we're going to give you the next 30 years is borrow. What kind of confidence is that? What does that say to our allies around the world? This has got to get fixed. It's got to get fixed right now. And it's not hard. And so here's the good news. The great news is this. There's a way out. Every time in American history, when we've reached a moment of crisis, Somehow, God has blessed us with a moment of opportunity. And that's where we are. We have a moment of crisis. I've tried to describe it as quick as I can. If you had three weeks, I could really lay the wood to it. But if we are at a moment of crisis. I would take another three weeks to tell you all the opportunities we have. Our college graduates are, I couldn't get into Georgia Tech today. I couldn't get into the University of Georgia today. I'm not kidding. Go dogs. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to do that. Um, so, you know, the point is, we're leaving a lot of kids behind them. Our vocational schools are underutilized, and so forth. So we're sitting here with a huge, by the way, our balance sheet, the federal government doesn't have a balance sheet. We don't have a capital budget. We don't have a, uh, an income statement. We basically have varying kinds of accounting. And so this is a really messed up world that we're talking about in terms of funding, all of this stuff. And I will tell you this. There are things that we can do. The first thing that we can do, in my opinion, is not hard, and that's growing the economy. Growing the economy right now, I, I, this economy is waiting to bust out, and here's why it's being held back. There's almost $7 trillion not at work in our economy. Now, $19 trillion economy, imagine that. We have nine, almost, not, almost uh, $7 trillion of equity not at work in our economy. I'll try to describe it. We have about $2 trillion, these are directly correct, don't hold me to the decimal, but $2 trillion on the bank balance sheets of the Russell 1000 companies, the largest companies in America, because of the uncertainty coming out of Washington and the regulation. Two, we have almost $2 trillion on bank balance sheets of small and regional banks because of Dodd-Frank. And three, we can have in foreign banks between two and three trillion dollars of U.S. profits that are held overseas. We're the last U.S. company, our country, 
that has a repatriation tax, which means we pay tax over there, you bring it back and pay tax again. So consequently, those dollars get invested overseas. That's nuts. That could be over. That could be over there. The, the United Kingdom did away with that in 2009 and lowered their corporate tax rate from 28 to 18. Our corporate tax rate today is 35. It's the highest in the world. So no wonder major corporations are looking to be headquartered in other places. It's our own fault. The second thing is regulation. 20,642 new regulations have been put in in the last eight years. 20,000 guys. And I don't have to tell you that. Whether you're in real estate, banking, farming, insurance, health care, it doesn't matter. The number one conversation I have with anybody I'm visiting with is get these regulations off my back. Just let me do business. Just tell me what the rules are and get out of the way. And the third is we have a God-given boom in energy. We can grow this economy. We're energy independent. We just don't act that way. We've got almost $300 billion of redundant agencies in the federal government. Redundant. I mean, this is insane. And if you don't do so, if we don't do something right now, Social Security and Medicare trust funds go to zero in 15 years. And I know how important Social Security was to my mom, and I can tell you it's in great jeopardy right now unless we do something to save it. Healthcare costs are rising at a rate this country's never seen before. Obamacare is collapsing under its own weight, and we have a lot of people who can't even afford the deductibles now who are up that are up 67% in the state of Georgia. Premiums are up dramatically. We've got a situation though where because of Alzheimer's, diabetes, and cancer, healthcare costs, the core inflator of healthcare, is going up dramatically. And nobody's arresting that. So here's the way out. And it's not that complicated. I just gave you the formula. Those things right there are five things that you could do, uh, or that Congress could do, or a White House could lead to change the direction of America and deal with the debt crisis, fund our military, provide leadership and foreign policy, and make the world a safer place. When you create vacuums of power around the world, you create uncertainty, and uncertainty breeds discontent. And right now, folks, we have 60 million people who are displaced in the world, 60 million who have lost their homes. These are refugees. I've been to Gaza Tep in Syria on the border of Turkey. I've been to the, the refugee pipeline in Kosovo, Macedonia, Norway, all the way up in, into uh, Germany and, and Belgium. Um, I've been to Southeast Asia. You know, I lived in Asia, I lived in Europe, and, and this, is a, this is a time when we need to tell our allies what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. What we've been doing is confusing our allies and emboldening our, our, uh, the people in the, who have our, the leaders of the dark forces of the world, who have self-interest of nationalism that are really creating a, a wholly dangerous world right now. The way out of here is very simple. We've got to break gridlock. The tools are there. Look, I'm a business guy. I just gave you the diagnosis. I gave you the, 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 the cure. Now, I'm not the smartest guy in the I'm not the smartest guy in this room. Those are just some ideas, but they will work, and they will get this economy going. If there's one thing I understand, it's the free enterprise system. And there are only about a handful of us in Washington that do. In the United States Senate, Johnny and I, I think, uh, George is the only state that has two U.S. senators who have a real business background. Now, how sick is that? And so we, we've got to deal with it. But here's the other formula that has to change. If we close these doors, we, this room could agree on each one of those areas. It wouldn't be a problem. We would agree, and we'd set a timetable, and we'd go fix it. In Washington, because of career politicians, the establishment, and all that, it gets convoluted. In the business world, it's linear. You go from A to B, and you're done. There, you go from A, and they don't even know B exists. They're not focused on results. So here's what has to happen. We have to break gridlock. My mission in life is to break the gridlock in Washington. And the way you do that, I mean, look at us in this, in this town. You make this town work across party lines. Politics works here. I mean, I'm up there trying to find the 80% solution because I know in business I never got my way. You know, I never got a 100% solution my way, and you didn't either. A good 80% solution, as long as I don't violate my principles, is what I'm trying to do. When did everybody say that if you and I disagree on something, that we have to be enemies? I mean, when did compromise become a, a four-letter word? When did you ever get your way? Are any of you married? <laughs> really? This is not the American way. I mean... What we've got is gridlock, and we have to break through with that. And this is what's at jeopardy, and I'm dead serious. Ronald Reagan said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We don't pass it down in our bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and passed on. So they can do the same thing. On one day, in our sunset years, we'll be sitting around telling our children, 
and our children's children what it was once like in America when women and men were free. Now I gotta tell you, if you don't believe me about anything else, believe me that okay, this one. That's at risk. I read the Gulag Archipelago by Socialist when I was 18. And it sowed me for life. One of my first jobs was in a, a Head Start program. That sowed me for life. This is not about the rich and the not so rich. It's not about liberal or conservative. It's really about America. And I want to read, I want to, I want to try to quote to you the, the closing line of the Declaration of Independence. And I'll close with this. And this is this is why our challenge. The Colonel asks his men and women to do this every day. Because they put their lives on the line for us every day, here and abroad. In full support of this declaration, and with firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor. God bless you for what you're doing. God bless Georgia, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you, guys. Thank you.